inflammatory atrophy, enteropathy of the digestive mechanisms. It is so common that when I was a young doctor, decades ago, I was taught by the giants of Boston gastroenterology and GI disease that there was already back then an epidemic of epidemics of digestive disorders that stood behind and were often the cause of most chronic degenerative autoimmune and inflammatory conditions. And the stomach does churn things around and the stomach does produce acid. Interestingly, people with ulcers have low stomach acid and healthy people have lots of acid in their stomach. So why we give proton pump inhibitors, uh, let me check, beats me. Hmm. Now, I know they're prescribed and I know that if you believe they work, they do. They are slightly better than placebos, slightly. When you inhibit stomach acid production, you set up a chain of events of maldigestion, uh, often with sensitization of the immune system because of impaired digestion. Hello and welcome back to another episode of High Intensity Health Radio. I'm your host, Mike Munzel, and I'm grateful and honored that you're here and decided to share a moment of your day with us and listen and learn and sharpen the saw and expand your knowledge of health and well-being. Today, we're live with Dr. Russ Jaffe, and he's board certified, doubly board certified, actually, in clinical chemistry and clinical pathology. He's a past podcast guest, so if you want to click the link below this or go to highintensityhealth.com slash drjaffe, you can watch the past episode where we talk more about environmental toxins and uh, nutrition ways to increase glutathione metabolism. As you know, glutathione is the body's primary antioxidant, and there's a lot of great dietary ways that you can boost that naturally. So we took a deep dive into that. But today, we took a deep dive into the gut and the gut microbiome, ways to improve digestion, digestive function, and uh, to prevent inflammation from gut imbalances, whether that's leaky gut, poor digestive issues, uh, fermentation of bacterial uh, you know, products made from food, and so on. We get into all these different things and also talk about meditation ways to calm down the digestive and inflammatory process and much more. So Dr. Jaffe is an expert in this area, but before we dive into the show, I want to share with you a little segment from the Autism Intensive, and Dr. Russ Jaffe is a featured expert on that. That's a free online event that's going to air towards the end of November. I'm going to play a video segment, so if you're listening to this on your phone, you can watch this over on YouTube. Just type in Dr. Russ Jaffe, Mike Mutzel, uh, or the Autism Intensive. It will pull it up, and I really want you to see this because Dr. Jaffe offered over 70 minutes of just cutting-edge content and information related to autism, brain health. Uh, this is applicable to parents, children, teachers, uh, adults who want to prevent age-related cognitive decline as well. So here's a quick one-minute video segment where he talks about the gut and glutathione and all the intricacies related to that, but he offers it in such an eloquent manner. The sound bites, the way that he explains things are very memorable so that you can pass these things on and pass on these concepts and ideas to your friends, family, and loved ones. Let's dive into the video interview with Dr. Jaffe. The microbiome. We need prebiotics, probiotics, and symbiotics. The prebiotics are the undigested fibers. Um, the probiotics are the good bugs. Uh, the symbiotics are things like glutamine. Now, more specifically, we need unprocessed fiber. We get that from grains, but they're hard to digest, and a lot of people have trouble digesting grains. So I want people to get their 40 to 100 grams of fiber from lentils and pulses and beans and tubers and root vegetables and seasonings and spices and making a very interesting, savory, detoxifying diet, because it turns out most of the herbs, in one way or another, are nature's detoxifying elements. So follow the dictum of Thomas Jefferson. Make condiments out of staples and staples out of condiments. So the staple is garlic, ginger, onions, brassica sprouts, or eggs. These are high sulfur detoxifying foods, G-G-O-B-E. So I hope you enjoyed that brief video segment of the Autism Intensive interview offered by Dr. Bress Jaffe. Again, that was just a one minute session of the over one hour interview that he offered for the Autism Intensive, which you can learn more about by going to theautismintensive.com. This is a free online event that's going to air throughout uh, the end of November. So I know you're gonna dig this. We have Sid Baker as a host, Norm Schwartz, who's another past podcast guest, Martha Herbert from Harvard. We have Mark Hyman, uh, Dick Deeth, uh, Marco Ruggiero, I mean, MD, PhD, just a 
lot of really great uh, informative people that are going to talk about dietary strategies to improve the health of the gut microbiome, to improve the health of the brain for both children, adults, and this is applicable for parents, teachers, uh, people that want to have children, uh, grandparents, uh, anyone that wants to optimize brain function and cognition can really benefit from this information. So again, the link there is theautismintensive.com. So with that, let's dive into the interview with Dr. Russ Jaffe. So um, with regard to uh, what we used to call digestion and what we now call the microbiome, the complete uh, community uh, of organisms that it turns out there are more of them than of us. So if you add up all the cells in the human body, it's about 100 billion. And then there's a trillion microorganisms in our digestive tract if we have a healthy one. But for too many people, there's a wasteland in that microbiome. We didn't get the right start. In other words, we didn't get the right implantation of the microbes because breastfeeding is getting more common, but breastfeeding until the child is ready to wean, breastfeeding until the gut of the child is mature enough to allow weaning is still very rare. But in those parts of the world where that's the common practice, you have the healthiest children with the fewest autoimmune, inflammatory, allergic-like conditions. And so in the case of my own children, who are now young adults, 30 and 27, uh, they were allowed to uh, breastfeed until they were ready to wean, uh, mostly because we were older parents and they were very high-risk children hmm. who have turned out to be very healthy uh, young adults. Uh, and the microbiome, the healthy aspect of their digestion uh, has been a very important part of why they've been resistant and resilient when others have been susceptible uh, and laid low. Mm -hmm. So we have always been in a dynamic communication, if you will, a communion between our metabolism, what we can call the metabolome or our body chemistry, and this digestive system, which is much more than I was taught. I was taught the stomach is like a uh, food processor. And there's a tube that connects the stomach to the tush. And along the way, things get mushed around. But, you know, it doesn't matter if it's processed or whole. It doesn't matter if it's organic, biodynamic, or commercial. You know, it's a little hard, and we don't have enough studies, and the studies we have aren't perfect. So maybe we should just get confused and do nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And because I learned so little in medical school, now 4,000 hours of medical school, 4,000 hours of postgraduate pathology training, double board certification, internal medicine, clinical laboratory medicine, uh, maybe four hours were devoted to digestion and nutrition. And if I remember correctly, one of those was taken by biochemistry because they needed an extra lecture. And one of those lectures was thrown in right after the exams when we were all exhausted. And I'm not sure anybody even showed up for it. <laughs> so when doctors show woeful unawareness of the details, the nuance, the elegance, the exciting opportunities that healthy digestion present, to some extent we have to forgive them because they just don't know. Now, 8,000 hours is a long time to be after college getting trained. And if in all of that time there wasn't a moment to emphasize how critical healthy digestion is for a healthy life, for feeling well, for restorative sleep, uh, for healthy weight, for uh, lower risk uh, so that you can repair yourself and not be subject to repair deficit, which is really inflammation, so I set out to debunk what I now recommend. Because I was so woefully ignorant, I started to debunk progressive nutrition, what we would call, what then was called orthomolecular, what we would today call progressive nutrition. I went to debunk mindfulness and meditation. I went to debunk Ayurvedic medicine. Uh, and as you know, I ended up in cross training in those areas as well as in Chinese medicine and acupuncture. Then I taught that to physicians feeling that at a minimum I should pay back the gift I had received of being trained by training others, uh, and then hopefully moving on to other areas of interest. So today, I start with whole, natural, and nurture. 
if we start with the criteria that we want to be whole, we want to be healthy and therefore in harmony with our nature and in harmony with the nature around us. If we want to nurture and be nurtured, then I suggest that the choices we make about what we eat and drink, what we think and do, are critical, absolutely critical, for lifelong as well as short-term quality of life, risk, risk enhancement or reduction, we can choose a diet today that absolutely increases the risk of diabetes, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, obesity, and then, di uh, then all the complications, cardiovascular and stroke, et cetera. On the other hand, my father, who was extremely high risk and undernourished to the point where as a child, his liver scarred because of such inadequate nutrition. Wow. Um, my father told stories about having to bring the coal up from the basement in the spring because it would always flood because they lived in the cheapest part of town right by the river. Mm -hmm. So my father, who we fortunately had till the age of 90, when he was 87 and after he was four years recovered from a catastrophic stroke, we scanned him from stem to stern and we found that he had a very healthy digestion because he was eating foods he could digest, assimilate, and eliminate without immune burden. And more importantly, when we scanned his heart and his blood vessels, they were a young adult. They were flexible, compliant, resilient. They were not hardened. They were not atherosclerotic. And I was particularly thrilled for my father uh, because he did what he was asked to do, and he was very diligent about that. But more importantly, he, he, he was pleased that I, his son, was able to help him. And, and you know how gratifying it is when you can help someone, really anyone, mm -hmm. but especially uh, a parent. Um, part of my practice today, as you know, is to see everyone as mother, father, brother, sister, son, daughter. And the extent to which we are willing to be interdependent with all life to me, is the extent to which we're willing to choose life. So to me, it's no longer a question. Nature, nurture, and wholeness are my guides. I eat the foods that I can digest, assimilate, and eliminate without immune burden. So we do check every six months a blood test. It's the LRA by ELISA Act blood test. It's one of the predictive biomarkers that we might want to talk about because when we're really healthy, when our digestion is working properly, we break foods down to building blocks. We assimilate them. They're transported in. They're chaperoned to where they need to go in the body. We rehabilitate and renew. And just as a reminder, no part of us is more than 10 years old, and that's our biggest bones. Largest blood vessels, seven years. Most of us is new within a few months. So one of the great myths, and it really is a myth. It's an absolute lie. One of the great myths is that we lose capacity, we lose ability, we lose uh, endurance uh, over the midlife, uh, after our 30s or 40s. And I, I remember my 30s and 40s, but I'm well past my 30s and 40s, and I have earned every one of these gray hairs. Um, at this point, I'm glad to tell you that I have recently been scanned, total body PET scan, brain PET, MRI of my chest and gut, a whole bunch of tests were done for a variety of reasons. And by every marker, I continue to function as about a 35 to 40 year old. And if I can stay at this level and document that like others, you can maintain a high level of quality of life through the entire lifespan, that we do not have to become statistics. The average person, whoever that is, does decline but they decline because they become more sedentary, they eat more processed foods, they take in more of the bad stuff, less of the good stuff, they don't feel as good about themselves, uh, about meaningful work uh, and meaningful moments with others. And so uh, I do have a rather complicated background, but part of my rehabilitation, part of my recovery, part of my becoming healthy was first to go out and debunk and then find people who became my teachers, my mentors, and eventually my patients. And it was a rare opportunity to both sit at their feet because I was ignorant and they were wise, and then to have a relationship where uh, I was able to help them uh, in regard to their own health 
uh, sometimes when they were 80 or 100 or even 110. Wow. So uh, there are proof in practice, and I am a voice that says we've overlooked huge opportunity. We've depreciated and deprecated nature as if nature was too simple, as if whole foods couldn't possibly be as good as restructured foods. And I'm old enough to remember when medicines were magic bullets and perfect and never harmful. I'm also old enough to remember that antibiotics didn't leave a devastation in the GI tract, which we now clearly know they do. Look at Mark LePay's book, When Antibiotics Fail. Uh, look at Michael Schmidt's work. There's a number of very fine, very readable uh, books that show when you lay waste to the microbiome, when you lay waste to the healthy bugs in the intestines, and you don't spend three to six months intensively replenishing every day healthy multiple organisms, acidophilus organisms and bifidus organisms and other organisms, through fermented foods, through active supplements. In my experience, live bugs work and dead bugs don't. Now, I know that's controversial, and there's some people who say it's only about particles. It doesn't matter if they're alive. No, I want CFU. I want colony-forming units. I want to know how many billion there are in each capsule or packet or sachet, whatever it is. So I do want live and multiple strains of human implantable. I recommend that people, whenever possible, eat people food and take people supplements. I know this is hard to understand, mm -hmm. but with my tongue in my cheek, I will suggest that human implantable strains are better for people. Um, I did mention and want to uh, emphasize that we can make our own uh, uh, probiotic, prebiotic, symbiotic uh, foods. We can make our own high fiber prebiotics that feed the good bugs. We can take in enough of the probiotic organisms to replenish the stresses of high tech living and the, the, the toxins that we are going to get exposed to. And the symbiotics, the recycled glutamine, for example, that helps repair the uh, intestinal tract, uh, forms a triad. Fiber prebiotics, bugs, probiotics, nutrients essential to repair the gut, like recycled glutamine, symbiotics. In the last three years, outside the United States, from Switzerland to Brazil, from Singapore to China, there's been a huge renaissance of proactive primary prevention public health initiatives to get people to eat more prebiotic high fiber foods, 40 to 100 grams a day is the goal, probiotic, 40 to 100 billion organisms, at least each day, and then the symbiotics. It turns out the lining of the intestinal tract is one of the most vulnerable places in the body. It's a place that turns over very rapidly. The lining of your intestinal tract today is different than it was two or three days ago. And this is very important because there are lots of things that come through our digestive tract that temporarily irritate some of the surface area, and we wanna keep a very large surface area. A healthy person's digestive tract, if laid out on a flat surface, would be as large as a tennis court. But most adults in America have had enough atrophy of their digestive tract because they haven't been nourishing and nurturing it that they have only a few square feet rather than many square meters. Hmm. And the good news is that in almost all cases, the body will rehabilitate when given the opportunity. So I hear two major mistakes. First of all, diet doesn't really matter. Just take in a certain amount of calories and control your calories and everything will be fine. And I'm telling you that is a myth. Mm -hmm. And the second myth is once we're over the edge, once we have fallen into that um, less than virtuous cycle that is slowly moving us down the ill slippery slope, that you can suppress the symptoms, you can slow the loss, you can reduce the suffering, but, you know, it comes with age. No, actually it doesn't. 
the age myth is about the proportion of unhealthy people at different age of life. Mm. So if you take a healthy group of 90 to 100 year olds, and I've done this, take a group of healthy 90 to 100 year olds, and then take a group of 20 to 30 year olds and draw their blood and culture their white cells do a biopsy of their muscle and culture their muscles and other cells, and you will not be able to distinguish a healthy nonagenarian from a healthy 19-year-old. You won't. That's profound. If we could pause right there, Russ, I think that brings up a great point because one of the things that it has been talked about in uh, you know clinical nutrition for a while is that hydrochloric acid production, like all other hormones, declines with age, and then that's what begets the dysbiosis and the gut inflammation and all that sort of stuff. So maybe talk to us about yeah, I mean you harped in, in, in great detail and so eloquently about the importance of digestion. So if this critical kind of iterative you know process is being perturbed by low stomach acid, what do we do? Is that true? And how can we boost stomach acid? Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's briefly review digestion. First of all, digestion begins with your eyes. So your eyes tell your gut and your brain. So we have a central nervous system and we have a gut nervous system. We have at least two. The eyes tell us what we're going to be consuming. Then the next stage of digestion is in the mouth, where we should do something other than open it, stick out our tongue, and throw the food in. So it really is healthier to chew the food because the little bits that get through the mucosa under the tongue and in the mouth inform the brain that informs the gut of what digestive juices will be needed for this specific meal. It's amazing. Then we get to the stomach and the stomach does churn things around and the stomach does produce acid. Interestingly, people with ulcers have low stomach acid and healthy people have lots of acid in their stomach. So why we give proton pump inhibitors, uh, let me check, beats me. Mm -hmm. Now, I know they're prescribed and I know that if you believe they work, they do. They are slightly better than placebos, slightly, but only slightly. But interestingly to me, Um, when you inhibit stomach acid production, you set up a chain of events of maldigestion, uh, often with sensitization of the immune system because of impaired digestion. So it's absolutely essential that we have some histidine, an amino acid called histidine, that donates the proton, the acid, that keeps the stomach acidic so that the pepsin the enzyme that loves to be in that acid environment, begins to open up the foods, especially the proteins and the concentrated foods. Then the acid chyme, chyme, C-H-Y-M-E, chyme is what we call the stuff that comes out of the stomach. So the acid in the chyme, the acid in what is delivered to the beginning of the small intestine, triggers a bicarbonate and digestive enzyme release from the pancreas. Notice I have not recommended that people take oral uh, enzyme supplements. That is not where digestive enzymes are meant to be. And if only because of my confidence in nature, nurture, uh, and um, being consistent with and emulating, uh, you know, uh, what, what we learn about physiologic and healthy function. Um, I have found that when you restore stomach acid production, maybe by supplementing with histidine, say 500 milligrams or 1,000 milligrams 30 minutes before a meal, and yes, amino acids are better taken on an empty stomach, you get an extra 20% peak uh, level when you take amino acids on an empty stomach. So we can improve stomach acid production, we can improve stomach digestive function, and therefore systemic uh, digestive function. So we meet the bicarbonate and the digestive enzymes that pour out of the pancreas to neutralize the stomach acids and begin the next phase. Then we get to this little duct where bile comes in to emulsify fats and bring fat soluble vitamins and nutrients into the body. And then we have about 20 feet where different nutrients are taken up selectively. We know there's at least three parts of the small intestine, then there's a large intestine, and the large intestine should not have digestive remnants. By the time we get to the ileocecal valve that separates the small intestine from the large intestine, 
uh, we should have broken the foods down to non-immune reactive building blocks that then get assimilated. There should be enough fiber to bind toxins so that the fiber can remove the toxins from the body and not recirculate the toxins. When we talk about toxins here, we're talking about putrescine, cadaverine, and other polyamines. And I, and I don't know anyone else who disagrees with this, I do not want a daily dose of cadaverine and, and putrescine coming into my body just mm -hmm. because I have a long transit time, just because the time from consumption to elimination is longer than the 12 to 18 hours that is healthy. And if you check your transit time and you find it to be 72 hours or even 144 hours, you're, an, you're a typical American. Uh, if you have a healthy transit time, it is 12 to 18 hours. And if you increase the fiber in your diet, if you eat foods that you can digest, assimilate, and eliminate without immune burden, uh, if you don't uh, overwhelm the amount, uh, you know, have some sense of portion control. And if you remind me, I'll tell you a personal story about portion control. Okay. Um, so that we don't overwhelm the body just in, you know, in, in amounts of food that we eat, even if it's good food. Uh, remember that a Caesar salad can have a thousand calories and you can think you're being virtuous, but it's still a thousand calories and a lot of fat. <laughs> that said is someone who used to often have a Caesar salad and now has an undressed salad very often. So when we look at digestion, it's remarkable how the system works to break down things that would be foreign, that would be considered invaders if they got into the body. But now, only about 1 in 20 people, if that many, so maybe 5% or less of the American population has a healthy transit time and a healthy digestion. So maldigestion, dysbiosis, inflammatory atrophy, enteropathy of the digestive mechanisms. It is so common that when I was a young doctor, decades ago, I was taught by the giants of Boston gastroenterology and GI disease that there was already back then an epidemic of epidemics of digestive disorders that stood behind and were often the cause of most chronic degenerative autoimmune and inflammatory conditions. And if that was true then, it's way more true today. <laughs> That's a, such a great point and segue, I think, to kind of go back to how you introduced that that last segment about digestion starts in the mat, you know, really in the mind and then in the mouth and then kind of uh, bridge that, you know, with your 10,000 hours that you've spent meditating. And, and so some practical takeaways for folks that uh, eat on the run, eat in the subway, right. eat in the car, eat at the office and so forth. Should we meditate beforehand to get into that parasympathetic state? Any pre-meal strategies that you found as a clinician to be particularly effective? Right. So we're going to look at what we eat and drink, and we're going to look at what we think and do. With regard to what we eat and drink, start with water being your beverage of choice. And that means at least uh, two quarts a day plus an additional glass for every adult beverage or, heaven forfend, a sugared, caffeinated, or artificially sweetened beverage. So water and herbal beverages and fruit spritzers become your beverage of choice. You know you're well hydrated, you know you're well hydrated when you pass the hydration test, which I'm demonstrating right now, not yeah. very well, but you pinch the skin on the back of the palm of your hand and you let it go. And I'm about a glass down, so instead of the, the skin going flat in one 1,000, mine slowly relaxed. And as soon as this interview is over, I'm not gonna stop in the middle, but as soon as we're done, I'm gonna have a glass or two of water and then if I check in another 20 minutes, I'll be better hydrated. Hmm. So this morning I had two glasses of water, but I also had a cup of coffee. We traveled a couple of hours to get to this conference center. Things are getting underway here. And I'm glad to tell you that for um, essentially one second of my time, I was able to confirm on camera that I need an extra glass of water. And having that reminder reminds me to have a glass of water. The, the way I summarize this is as follows. Have a carafe of water and a glass in front of you. If the glass is full, drink it. If the glass is empty, fill it. Go through the day. So hydration, very important uh, and often overlooked. Mm -hmm. Then let's eat whole foods as much from a community-supported agriculture, as much from your own home garden, 
We happen to have a permaculture biodynamic food forest in our front yard, 250 edible plants. It's now five or six years old. You're welcome to come and visit and see how we uh, adapt uh, to the challenges of uh, high-tech living uh, in a very high-touch, somewhat high-tech way, but high-tech that serves us. And Mike, you proposed a very important question. I get this all the time. How can I continue to behave in a way that feeds my problem but do something better for myself that either calms me down or somehow gets me through. And my answer is, gosh, the people who mentored me pointed out that when we multitask to the point where we're driving, texting, and eating, <laughs> we have already set the seeds for the very problem that we're wanting to avoid. And I work all the time with high performance executives, with young physicians, with people. And I point out that if we allow ourselves the privilege of doing one thing at a time, for example, when you drive, just drive, don't talk, just do one thing at a time. Now, I know that there are people out there who are thinking to themselves, oh my God, I have to do four things because I'm late, I'm late, I'm very, very late. Well, I used to be that way. I can show you videos of me. I was an archetype of the A-plus personality, the multitasker extraordinaire. And the times when I got irritable and didn't get enough restorative sleep, it was always someone else's problem until I finally woke up to realize that I was the common denominator in all of those circumstances. So I don't have the magic answer. I do find that 20 minutes twice a day for most people is plenty to calm down their sympathetic, the sympathomimetic, the adrenaline part of the nervous system, and enhance the parasympathetic, the serotonin, the soothing part. Now, when we start by taking in lots of calcium and not much magnesium, lots of sodium and not much potassium, uh, lots of simple sugar, not enough fiber, we're setting the stage for a biochemical roller coaster that is very hard to manage and will take charge of us. And so people often say, gee, I have to get everything done before lunch because after lunch I get foggy and then I really want to take a, a nap, but I go get some caffeine uh, or I just take a break and uh, I wish I could uh, relax, but I don't have time. Yeah. Well, I really cannot speak for anyone else, but for myself and for those who have followed my guidance, we have found that when you devote 20 minutes morning and evening to yourself with a mindfulness relaxation response, maybe with the use of a green dichromatic light to help reset the pineal control center deep in the brain, maybe with five minutes of abdominal breathing and 15 minutes of active meditation while you're under the green light. And so there are tools. These tools have been refined over millennia, not just over the last 50 years. We can um, re-enchant uh, ourselves with everyday life. How do you re-enchant yourself with everyday life? What I suggest is go out in nature and just amble. Just amble around a little bit in nature. And if you're having trouble with this, bring a young child with you mm -hmm. and just follow them. They are absolutely enchanted. Now, we happen, as you know, to live out in the woods by choice because I think it's healthier to have it be dark at night and have the sun be something that wakes you up. But our children, therefore, were woods children and subject to ticks and all of the things that concern parents about modern living. And what we were able to show over the years that both of our children mounted healthy, immune responses and protected themselves, yes, they were exposed. They were exposed to these harmful potential pathogens, the Borrelias, the Ehrlichias. They got names that go on for days now. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, and we were able to prove this with the help of, of evidence-based medicine, fortunately, they were mounting healthy protective responses, not chronic 
and ill responses, which illustrates a point I want to make, which is healthy people have healthy responses, and people at risk should correct their risky behavior, eating processed food rather than whole food, eating foods that uh, your body is is reactive against, is sensitive to, is not tolerant to. Our immune system wants to be tolerant because every day we make cancer cells and the immune system is supposed to identify them and eliminate them. Not only that, every day we have a certain amount of wear and tear. But before the immune system can do its repair function, it has to defend us against anything foreign that's invading. And that's a pretty smart uh, priority on the part of the immune defense and repair system. But many of us have our immune system so completely preoccupied with defense that we just defer repair. And when you refer, defer the repair long enough, it becomes what we call inflammation. So as a pathologist, I can say in Latin the five different aspects of inflammation, but I won't teach you anything except that I know some Latin words. Uh, as a physiologist, as a physician who's now interested in proactive primary prevention and personalized evidence-based medicine, I can tell you that uh, repair deficits are the rule, not the exception, that we correct those with enough antioxidants and buffering minerals, as well as stress adaptation. Enough, uh, enough antioxidants means doing a C cleanse to determine how much ascorbate, the mother antioxidant that sacrifices herself, that all other antioxidants are regenerated and protected. Uh, how much ascorbate do we need at any given time in light of our oxidative uh, stress and toxic load? Uh, how much magnesium do we need to keep our first morning urine pH in the six and a half to seven and a half goal range? Um, and very often magnesium is very hard to get in. Uh, it's known as the forgotten electrolyte. Uh, but chronic latent magnesium deficiency that is being in the lower half of the serum range for magnesium is very common. So lack of magnesium is widely recognized in evidence-based uh, science and medicine today. However, doctors are pretty um, uh, hopeless about magnesium because it's hard to get in and it tends to run out as fast as it comes in. But just a few years ago, an enhanced uptake and chaperone delivery system of magnesium, combining magnesium with choline citrate, and it must be in the choline citrate form, uh, enhances uptake and chaperones delivery so that the cell doesn't get too acidic, so that the cell doesn't shift from elective protective to survival mode, so that the proton gradient that's necessary for the mitochondrial battery to work can work because that proton gradient is based on enough magnesium or potassium to neutralize the proton acids that come out of the mitochondria when we get the ATP that we want from the battery. So many people are in survival mode without knowing it. Many people are not able to um, repair themselves because there's so much burden on their immune defense work system. Um, many people uh, have a cellular metabolic acidosis and their um, energetic system is shutting down. They're easily fatigable. Uh, they do not get restorative sleep. Uh, they're often more irritable than they would like to be. So we can choose a whole and healthier, more nutrient dense diet and with the help of predictive biomarkers like the LRA from ELISA ACT, like the first morning urine pH, uh, like the uh, high sensitivity C-reactive protein, which is a measure of inflammation, laboratory measure, uh, but you want the HSCRP, the high sensitivity version. And indeed, I think we will find all of the biomarkers better when they're done in a high sensitivity mode by labs that offer less than 5% variance on results rather than the usual 20%. So if I'm looking at a test and I only care about the statistical reference, then if the lab is plus or minus 15 or 20 percent, it's okay. But if I'm a doctor taking care of an individual and I'm going to change your life, Mike, based on the results of a hemoglobin A1C or an HSCRP or a homocysteine or an LRA by ELISA ACT or a vitamin D level or a first morning urine pH or an omega-3 index or an 8-oxoguanine, and those are the eight. Uh, if I'm going to guide therapy, then I really want the labs to provide me high precision results. And to me, that means less than 5% variance rather than the usual 15 to 20%. Because if the number is within 5%, then I can use that for personalization uh, of therapy and guide outcomes. 
Wow, great questions there. I didn't know if you're going to keep going. So you brought up a lot of uh, fascinating topics, and I would like to uh, uh, kind of uh, emphasize the importance of being mindful to our, to our audience because you have you know you know degrees and board certifications in clinical chemistry and pathology, Russ. So um, in, in the hierarchy of health, I mean, we, we've been talking about all day the importance of digestion, whole food, micronutrient balance, you know, mitochondrial health and oxidative uh, reductive reductive balance and so forth. You know, meditation. I think it's a hard sell. You said you know at least twenty minutes twice a day according to your mentors and, and you're, you know, an active meditative practitioner, mm-hmm. where do you rank that in the hierarchy of, uh, you know, things that people can do to uh, optimize their health and maybe kind of sell our audience here who, who thinks that five minutes of meditation is okay. Like prioritize that if you would. Well, yes. Um, in a time when attention spans are often very short, you know, measurable in seconds and a few minutes, the very notion of 20 minutes, which is actually a very short period of time, is itself often longer than many people are comfortable uh, with. And um, when you look at every tradition around the planet that has a uh, healthy or long-lived subgroup, everyone makes time for themselves because at an early age or at some time in young adulthood, they decide that they want to live and therefore they want to be peaceful enough that the stress of daily living doesn't wear them out. The stress of job, family, responsibilities, and others. So having come from a family where there's lots of uh, chronic illness and lots of um, lack of mental equilibrium and health. I can tell you that I made a very conscious choice uh, to find where my peaceful center was. And once you find that, my experience is that you don't want to be outside that center. Most people, however, even as children, are pushed out of their quiet place and never really given an opportunity to find it again. Uh, And as a consequence, The idea that we could gain from quiet, that we could gain from stillness, that we could gain from just being. And by the way, when you start quietly just breathing and being, hundreds, if not thousands, of thoughts come up, some of which are in the category of, we must run and do something right now. And eventually, you realize that this is the chatter. This is the distracting conversation that is going on inside every human being. I have chosen, and the people who I learn from and and I'm mentored by, like Bob Leichman, have found, that when we choose to practice inner peace, our world somehow around us becomes more peaceful. It's called the spreading phenomenon. When we're willing to choose ourselves for at least 20 minutes twice a day. And I say at least because when I first proposed to Bhante, the Cambodian monk who was my principal mindfulness mentor, when I first asked if he could give a very short introduction to silent Vipassana mindfulness technique, he said, oh, I am very suited to do that. I can give a very short course, only six months. (laughs) I said, Bhante, Six minutes in America is already a long time. He said, that is part of problem. That is part of problem. Now, this was the man who was the basis for Yoda in the Star Wars movies and so forth. So he was a very interesting character. And in very pithy, very simple ways, he spoke to the fact that he had recovered from being deathly ill, that most of us are on the way to becoming chronically ill, and it is a choice. So I'm not here to convince anyone. I don't know that that I can or that it's really uh, within my ability to do that. But if people will come and spend time with me, they will notice that I do take regular opportunities to recenter, regular opportunities to stay with my breath. In fact, when you practice breathing to the point where even under stress you keep breathing, that's a good thing. In fact, I've been in many situations where just being able to stay with my breath allowed me to see ways of resolving the conflict without violence. And in some cases, it looked like it was going to be pretty messy. But time and will 
are a function of practice. Um, when you talk to the Dalai Lama, which I hope everyone has the opportunity to do, uh, he'll say he's just a simple monk and he has learned through practice the value of practice. Mm. So you're right. I've probably logged well over 10,000 hours of quiet. Um, for me, um, meditation and mindfulness uh, are in the same category as breathing, uh, as drinking water, uh, and as consuming food. Now, I can tell you from personal experience that you cannot just actively meditate and not go out and physically move around. Um, I am better at meditating than I am at physical activity. And I can tell you from experience that if you do physically exercise and then mentally exercise in an active meditation, that's doubly helpful. But if you just mentally see yourself exercising and never do any weight bearing or other cardio or core exercise, you're fooling yourself. Yeah. Um, and similarly, you can't take 2B6 to equal a B12. We now know through these predictive biomarker and other tests what the biochemical individuality is for each person. And so as a physician, but also as a consumer, we no longer have the right to say, oh, it's all over but the shouting. It can't get personal enough. The tests aren't good enough. I hear doctors say all the time, it doesn't matter, you know, either nature heals or not, and that's just the way it is. And it's a kind of fatalism. It's a kind of um, acquired um, downer uh, mentality um, because most of what we have available is to suppress the signs and symptoms of ill health rather than to identify the causes, which is what we're talking about, and redress them. Right. And well, because I'm, quote, a reformed whatever, you know, I used to be someone who uh, followed uh, the conventions. Um, because I've changed my habits, uh, I think that I have the privilege of saying to other people, give it a try. Uh, there are some wonderful songs. Uh, Bobby McFerrin has one called Don't Worry, Be Happy. Uh, MC Yogi has one that's called Be the Change. Be the change you aspire to be. That's a Gandhian uh, line. Um, uh, but the fellow I mentioned, Bhante, worked directly with Mohandas Gandhi, converted Ambedkar to Buddhism, brought Buddhism back to India, and that was only one of several things that he did that were really quite remarkable, about which he never boasted, uh, but was able to to be there when needed, and when called upon, didn't flinch. Wow. <clears throat> Eloquently said there, Russ. Thanks for sharing that deep aspect of uh, mindfulness and meditation. I think it's, like you said, a lot of people need to be okay with working on me time and, and work on that quiet time and connecting with their breath. It's very powerful. Now, yeah. one thing you mentioned uh, in that last segment was ab about the host and about your children and exposing mm -hmm. them to bugs. And it's really not so much, I mean, the microbes play a huge role, but it's also the host physiology. And, mm -hmm. and um, one thing that comes up a lot in the context of SIBO is people think, you know, they can't eat certain foods high in fiber and fermentable carbohydrates and, and stuff like that because it's bad for them and they've heard it's mm -hmm. bad and so forth. So maybe if you could talk, if we can finish up this discussion a little bit with, you know, you mentioned that, you know, people throughout the world, you know, indigenous peoples eat 100 plus grams of fiber per day. That's why their bacterial diversity is so high. So has our host immune system changed now that we can't tolerate that much fiber? Talk to us about that. No, no. Uh, SIBO, small intestinal bowel overgrowth, is a product of antibiotic treatment unless proven otherwise. So you gain this problem by laying waste to the normal uh, probiotic microflora of the digestive tract of the microbiome. The physiologic answer is three to six months of progressively enriched prebiotic, probiotic, symbiotic, You've got to repair the surface area. That's where the recycled glutamine comes in. You've got to get good bugs in and some fiber because that nourishes the bugs. But if you have laid waste to an area, you don't just come in and paint it green and say everything's fine. You slowly build up through fermented foods, through easy to digest whole foods, uh, through more fruit in the diet, which provides pectin and fiber, and avoiding, avoiding processed foods, especially isolated or processed sugar, fat, and protein. When you do that, over the same few months that people fight with the symptoms of SIBO, 
you can reverse the causes. And when you reverse the causes, now you find that Dr. Dennis Burkett, who won the Nobel Prize for his first body of work, was correct about digestion. And he went around Africa for several decades noticing that people who ate 40 to 100 grams of fiber a day had essentially no irritable bowel syndrome, ulcerative colitis, regional enteritis. And they could give stool specimens the way we give urine specimens. Hmm. So what I see happening is people go from one extreme to the other. First, they don't realize the devastating consequences of the prior antibiotics. Then they want their digestion to be uh, socially acceptable, that means no gas, uh, in, a, in a day or two. And uh, it, it's naive, it's a contradiction in terms, it just can't be done. When you realize the cause of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is the lack of the good things and probably too much of the bad things in regard to digestion, then you want to slowly rebuild digestion from the ground up with prebiotics, probiotics, and symbiotics. And if you have trouble with that, call people like me because we see the complicated situations and there are some. Uh, but for most people, uh, we have been uh, misinformed and we therefore think backwards, we think incorrectly, and therefore reach incorrect conclusions. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, that uh, the answer to small intestinal uh, bowel overgrowth is antifungals. Now, if you have partially digested food getting to your colon, you're going to have candida and other fungal overgrowth, and that's not good. But if you follow my suggestions with C-Cleanse, with magnesium and choline citrate based on first morning urine pH, you'll quickly restore a 12 to 18 hour transit time. You'll quickly be able to regenerate the absorptive, digestive, and surface area capacity uh, of the small intestine. And now you can build up fiber. So yes, anyone who takes in too much fiber, whatever that means, will eventually get gas. Mm, great. But, but for most of us, for me, it's now something like 500 grams of fiber. So I actually have pushed myself to those limits because I do experiments on myself from time to time. Um, and yes, uh, a person with healthy digestion can take in so much fiber that they will get, uh, you know, gasification. Um, however, for healthy people, that's way beyond what you would usually uh, uh, expose yourself to. So um, I think this is a good example of where we have a mechanistic misunderstanding leading to inappropriate symptom suppressive therapy, leading to more complications and then more less than virtuous cycles of therapy. And what I'm suggesting is the opposite. Let's identify the cause. Let's get the good stuff in and the bad stuff out. And for some people, especially for younger people, that may mean a near elemental diet for a while. That may mean broths and things that they can very easily digest, assimilate, and eliminate. Because if you were looking from the standpoint of the digestive tract itself, if we could shrink ourselves down and be looking out from the, uh, you know, the uh, cells there uh, lining, what we would see is that instead of having healthy mucins and healthy secretory IgA and other healthy things to protect us, that the lining of the intestines has switched to survival mode. And until we rehabilitate the relationship between the microbiome and the metabolome, between the digestive uh, tract uh, and the immune system uh, that repairs and lines the intestinal tract, until we begin to rehabilitate that, we're going to have trouble. And since I don't like trouble and I don't want to trouble trouble, I want to get to the causes and, and redress them at that level. And then I find that the other suppressive therapies just don't have any place uh, in the uh, therapeutic uh, milieu. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said there, Russ. I like how you kind of go big and then go small again and, and add in the practical stuff there. But, you know, there's some kind of fear-based, you know, things going around the internet that you should even avoid bone broth if you have SIBO because of the glycosaminoglycans and this and how that can fuel bad bugs. And so I think, you know, I like your approach is really, you know, get rid of the bad stuff, reintroduce the good stuff, but take a you know, take three to six months and rebuild and, and provide the micronutrients to get out of that alarm mode in the enterocytes themselves. So, and if you're concerned, go to quality, go to wholeness. So get a biodynamic broth. 
get a biodynamic vegetable broth if you want to avoid bone broth. Now, if the bone of the animal, if the animal was unwell, the bone's going to be unwell. But if it's a biodynamic animal, then it was fed very well. It was inspected to make sure that it wasn't unwell. Um, and I think that is an option. Uh, there are nutrients in bone broths that in certain circumstances can literally save a life. Yeah. On the other hand, commercial bone broths are full of a lot of schmutz that went into the commercial animals, and that's not what we're talking about. Right. That's a great distinction that's sometimes lost from the discussion. It's like, you know, where's animal coming from and what did that animal eat? What sort of, you know, metals or toxins bioaccumulated in that animal? So, And, and let me illustrate that with a very quick story. This is from Paul Keen, uh, the founder of the first biodynamic uh, large-scale uh, production facility called Walnut Acres. And it isn't so much about animals, but it's to illustrate the point that biodynamic is really different than organic and very different than commercial. So they had... 400 acres, and at one point they had 200 acres of biodynamic wheat. They had two farmers on other sides that were organic, Amish farmers, two that were commercial, and comes the weevils, the boll weevils. And the boll weevils ate the commercial wheat to the ground, ate the organic wheat to the ground, and Paul Keene had this wonderful photograph of his wheat standing tall as the weevils left town. So when you have a really healthy food, the pests don't like that food, and that food is meant to recharge, to rebuild, to rehabilitate us. And so it really does matter where our food comes from. And in my case, we start mostly with whole foods and we make them in our kitchen. We invest in our kitchen so we don't have to invest in the emergency room. And we also know the source, the farm to fork uh, 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 sequencing. Um, uh, it, 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 to me, it enriches the experience when the farmer personally hands off to you the food that you're then going to prepare in ways that cannot help, from my point of view, but re-enchant us with everyday life and reconnect us with the interdependence uh, that is now a survival necessity, no longer an elective opportunity. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. So uh, for the listeners that may not be familiar with the whole biodynamic concept, maybe you can summarize that. I believe you have like, you know, insects that have predatory aspects on other pathogenic type insects. Is that kind of the premise there or? No, no, uh, no. There's, there were three things that Rudolf Steiner brought forward. One of them was biodynamic farming. You can think of it as super organic. You do make certain preparations, what they call 501, 502, 503, 504, 505. And some of these you feed the roots to enrich the relationship between the microorganisms and the roots. Some of them you do fuller feeding. You spray onto the plant at certain times during the year. Um, the bottom line is... Uh, uh, organic, in my opinion, is clearly better than commercial, less contaminated, more nutrients. But biodynamic is an order of magnitude more dense in terms of nutritional quality and more able to exclude the pathogens or the toxins uh, that are all around us. So biodynamic is like another level up from super organic uh, I believe that it is the agriculture of the future, that it can rehabilitate contaminated land more quickly and more effectively than any other system. But most importantly, it provides us a sustainable food source at a time when the stress and toxins of high-tech living are going up. So I believe we should defend ourselves with even healthier food than ever. Yeah, great, great point there. There was a there's a winery in Glen Ellen, California. It's uh, Benzinger, I believe. Uh, right, they a have a biodynamic right. Right. Yeah, they have sure. a dynamic a ton about this stuff. So if, if people are in the, the Bay Area and, and have a chance to head up to the wine country, that's a great way to kind of get an insight. Yes, or if you're in the Bay Area, go to the Regenerative Design Institute, RDI, uh, at Commonweal on the Mesa Road outside of Bolinas. Say hi for me. Um, when that farm was uh, started in the late 1970s, the students were students of Bonte. So I have very fond memories of that garden when it was very young, uh, giving meditation classes there. And then a whole generation later, my son did his regenerative design permaculture certification under Penny Livingston there at RDI. Oh, uh, wow. So if you're in the Bay Area, you have a wonderful resource. If you're not, look for CSAs, community-supported agriculture, but especially biodynamic CSAs. Hmm. 
Beautifully said there, Russ. We have a lot of listeners in uh, California, so I'm sure we'll have a lot of folks will be interested in what you just said there. So, Russ, thanks so much again for coming on the show. And any parting advice or tips or, uh, you know, talking points that we didn't get to mention that you wanted to share with our listeners? Well, no, just in summary, we become the result of what we eat and drink, what we think and do. So choose well and wisely using nature, nurture, and wholeness so that what you eat and drink, you can assimilate and eliminate uh, without immune burden, uh, and then take a little time to laugh, to touch, uh, to nurture yourself mindfully and be well. Well, that concludes this episode of High Intensity Health Radio. Thanks for tuning in and thanks for subscribing over on iTunes. If you're watching on YouTube, you can also subscribe here because I often launch the videos before we put the iTunes version, uh, the MP3 version over on iTunes. And so I hope you can take action on some of this information. I know we covered a lot of information about meditation and stress reduction and ways to revamp the health of the gut microbiome, but there's a lot of practical how-tos that you can implement in your home. So please take action on one item that you learned today and let me know what you think. Write me a review write me a comment on the YouTube channel or over on the blog at highintensityhealth.com. So with that, hope you have a happy and healthy day and we'll catch you on the next podcast.